Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, do you know who we have on the show today? Nope. Well, good news. I'm going to tell you. Uh, A man of many talents and uh, a man who is almost synonymous with tabletop gaming. Well, I'm going to say that. Mr. Ryan Chappells. Thank you for being on, Ryan. Well, hey, thanks for uh, having me on here. I heard the word synonymous, and then I didn't catch the second word, so I'm just on the edge of my seat wondering what the follow-up to that was. (laughs) Synonymous with tabletop gaming. Wow. That's a, hey, that's either a big crown or a a big expectation. (laughs) (laughs) Both. It's a crowning expectation. Yeah, yeah. Now you've got you've got to live up to this now. Yeah, right. Like, uh oh. Well, it always like you you hang out with like the cool kids in in tabletop gaming. You you like like if, if the who's who of of the industry, <laughs> you hang out with them. That's my impression. I I guess that's that's one way you could put it. I'd say more okay. like uh, I've worked with a lot of different people, like from top the bottom um i don't know cool kids i don't know i feel like <laughs> i feel still like a like a nerdy outsider like i think that's right. why i liked being a producer is like i want to put like the cool people you know in a room um whether you know you've heard about them or not and then let them do their thing like i'm a, I'm a facilitator for <laughs> cool kids at heart that's not a bad profession to get into facilitating cool kids yeah sounds like there's money in that there's not. I would. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> oh, if only. I was like, man. I think you're being sarcastic. But let <laughs> me clarify, in case there's any, you know, children who are young and impressionable. Yeah. Do you do not go into games and you do not go into streaming, uh, for the money. Now, podcasting. That's where the money's at. Oh yeah. So. Is is there's money in this? <laughs> what? Oh, are you kidding? We're making we're making ducats over here. Buckets of ducats. Um. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's all good. Tell me, like, when you started in in like the tabletop landscape, uh, what were you doing originally when you started? Sure, yeah. So my first professional experience in tabletop, you know, my first tabletop experience is probably around like ten or eleven or so, uh, playing D anD D three point five. But my first professional experience was when uh, I came on board at uh, Hyper RPG, which is a Twitch channel uh, you should definitely check out that does a ton of uh, RPG-focused content, no surprise. Uh, I was brought on as a uh, production assistant. I was, like, partially also, truthfully, trying to just escape Chicago (laughs) and escape the the Midwest any way possible because I had spent, like, the first 25 years of my life there and I, I love it there but i was like i was feeling the itch real real strong and this opportunity came up and i was like yeah okay this this seems interesting why not and i remember uh i remember like right before i left i like met up with a friend and was like hanging out with some of his co-workers and i remember telling this uh this lady she's like oh hey so you're moving to uh seattle and i was like yeah i'm moving to be a a pa and she's just like who moves to be a pa (laughs) (laughs) oh my god it cut me to my core you know you have a song in your heart and you gotta follow the dream (laughs) yeah and now like in her defense i'm like yeah that's a pretty good point (laughs) but yeah i think yeah i think that just highlights only only listen to that one person (laughs) And and now where am I? Oh, it's all gone downhill. And now where are you? I wouldn't say it went downhill. Things seem to work out pretty well. No, I've been. I think I've been very, very fortunate. Sarcasm aside, uh, I think I've been incredibly lucky. So that's you know, if there's any advice to give to people who are interested in in tabletop RPG uh, lifestyle, just get, be really lucky. Be you know, be willing to like work 14 hours a day but also be really lucky no probably don't work 14 hours a day anyways i feel like there's gonna be a crunch conversation somewhere in this podcast but not now not now we're still getting the lay of the land so you had mentioned like when you were 10 that was like when you got into 3.5 was that really your entry point into uh gaming well gaming you know um 
started, I guess, at a much younger age with like uh, the original uh, NES, Sega Genesis. Those were were both oh. these like mystical objects in my yes. living room that like I just wanted to understand how to use and how to play. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's games like oh man, Contra Hardcore on the Genesis, just getting destroyed over and over in that game. Uh, and then the first game that really made a huge impression on me uh, was called uh, Final Fantasy, surprisingly <laughs> enough. And uh -huh. it was just different than anything I'd ever played. You know, it's a very different experience than playing, like, you know, uh, Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> yeah, no, a, <laughs> a 180 for Super Mario Brothers. Which Final Fantasy, however? Uh, just the, it's the original Final Fantasy, which still to this day is like one of my favorites and i've like played it now i think i've beaten it four times it sets so much of the series up like you know you think like oh this can't be the game where they introduce the airship yeah airship is in the first final fantasy giant <laughs> map uh boss who is like has a really convoluted relationship where he's actually himself from the future and he's the first yeah. boss and the last boss it's all there everything you expect from a final fantasy <laughs> game is set in stone they set their formula real early <laughs> yeah they nailed it and it's like it, it's just like extra beautiful to me because it's you know it's more abstract it's less detailed like so as a kid like there's so much imagination that you project onto that world and onto those characters as you go through the game you know so much more was there than was actually there and uh that's like kind of the cool thing about you know playing a a, a more limited game like visually i think now the real question is is that the best final fantasy game <laughs> no no the real question is was there someone named sid Ooh, i don't think there's a sid there's, man, there's cool swords, like you build Excalibur at some point, and I think it's spelled with an X. Is there a Sid in there? I thought Sid. There's a Sid in every other Final Fantasy. I don't know. Yeah. This is uh, this is where I should be, like, Googling it right now, so I sound like I know everything. But I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll fix no. it in post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Alex, this is me fixing it in post. Uh, Sid did not appear in the original NES version of Final Fantasy. He was mentioned in the remakes uh, so that he would appear in every Final Fantasy game, but he did not originally appear in it. Uh, he, the original Sid actually appeared in Final Fantasy 2 and was then some sort of character in every game after that. There. Fixed in post. Back to the show. Though I would say my favorite Final Fantasy, this question came up, uh, definitely Final Fantasy Tactics, the original oh, okay. for PlayStation. Final Fantasy X, because it's the first one I played. Nice. That's also, that answer seems completely valid. It's it's not 13. Oh, oh, no, sorry. It wasn't the first one I played. It's the first one I owned. I played 8. How many Final Fantasy games that you've played have you beat? I know I, I'm not the one who should be asking questions here, but I, um, <laughs> I find this to be a great 10. question. I, I beat 10. Okay. At least. I have over 300 hours into 10, so... Wow. That monster arena, those things are complete assholes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, was ten the only one that you uh, you finished? Yeah, I don't. I didn't like the ones after it. Actually, they're hard to finish, even when you like them. <laughs> they're huge. Yeah, it's true. I did not finish thirteen, or thirteen, two, or three. I yeah, I haven't played thirteen. I took seven all the way to the final dungeon that Sephiroth is in, never beat it. I took ten all the way to the end where all you have to do is fight Jack. didn't beat it, slash sin. Um, well, you beat Jack and then you beat you, Yevon. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, I have a, a way of, like, playing to the end and just never playing again, apparently. Who needs to play games? <laughs> There's just so many of them. There are a lot of them, yeah. I they keep coming out with more of them every day. <laughs> they always have to be bigger and richer and more character focused. What's that about? I think I've tried to play almost every Final Fantasy, but I I can't say that I've spent a ton of time in any individual one. I think I played 13 for about 30 hours because that was the one where they said, uh, you know, it's really Is that linear. the one where it gets good? Yeah, after it's, the, that? it's the thing where they said, yeah, for the first 30 hours, it's really linear, but then it opens up. And so I played it like, okay, I just have to stick with it until this game opens up. And then it opened up, and I was like, oh, this is it. I don't want to play now. <laughs> this is what I was. This is what I came here for. Now it's a grind fest through a giant open field. Oh, okay. 
sure thanks for that you know what i think i'm good yeah you really got to have a big payoff if you're gonna be like oh. just go through 30 hours of you know mediocrity <laughs> yeah and it did not um, and, then, <laughs> and then they like, like the second one i liked more just because they were like no there's just like a bunch of different timelines and stuff just go and explore stuff i'm like oh thank you i <laughs> can just i had I have like a run of the mill through time and space now. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that was uh, better. But no, 15 was the only one I actually finished. Uh, it was something. Um, that's cool. I haven't even played 15 yet. So you're, you're yeah. ahead of me. Uh, I played 10, 10, <laughs> 2. Sorry, I played 10, 2, then 10, because that's when I got first. Um, oh, sorry. okay. Then I played the one Fran and, and I think Nathan has like, my game still oh the uh 12 uh 12, 12? i think oh, it was 12 yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and 12 i didn't like 12 at all <laughs> it was the real-time combat wasn't it <laughs> it was the real-time atb combat yeah sort of real time no, sort of okay. not yeah i didn't get through that one it was like we're gonna give you pseudo turn-based while being free roam and i was like no i'm not having this oh they went nino cooney on you they went stupid <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Well, you know, in 15, they pretty much just went all to real time. That's fine. I'm okay with real time. Not real time and time yeah. delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could see the monsters. I anyway. like that too. So when you did do the first Final Fantasy, is that really like your, your introduction to role-playing games in general? Yeah, that was definitely my first time playing it. Like, I think I was trying to play it when I was like maybe five or six. And so I had no idea what I was doing. I was completely confused. I was, but I was just loving how big and immersive it was. Like I was, I, you know, it came with a map and I was like studying this map and it, it really, you know, when you're that young, it's like, wow, this feels so real. And then there's like, oh, here's a chart with all these weapons and their different stats on it. Um, that's kind of where I had my first taste of just being completely lost in a, in a fictional uh, world and just enjoying that so much more than being like i don't know just a kid in the suburbs who didn't find anything uh interesting to do uh, you know at the, at the time that was sort of the best best possible experience so how does that eventually lead you into like tabletop gaming basically i got more and more into video games and actually a game the original neverwinter nights is what really got me into tabletop um and in some ways it's like still i think the best tabletop rpg experience i've ever had i didn't play the campaign i tried a couple times but uh if you have played it the original campaign for neverwinter nights is horrid <laughs> it gets better it's still never gonna be you know like a Baldur's gate 2 or you know anything of that caliber but what was awesome about neverwinter nights is me and my friends uh got into role play servers so you could have up to 64 other humans, uh, multiple people logged in as DMs, uh, all in huge custom-built worlds, all role-playing different characters. And so it, it automated, you know, a lot of the rules. It was based on uh, third edition. It, you know, automates most of the rules. So the complexity of the game was greatly reduced. And instead, you just got to focus on role-playing. Um, and, and that, to me, is, like, just... That's exactly what I want more and more from role playing right. games is to to get the game out of the way yeah. uh, these yeah, days. At yeah. least. <laughs> well, in Neverwinter was uh, you you could build your own scenarios like like a real tabletop RPG, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, so you could build your own module, or you could just have someone playing as the DM and bringing in NPCs or enemies, you know, at random. You might be just like, like, you just be minding your business in, like, town, maybe chatting it up with some some people around, uh, you know, a bonfire, and then, like, I don't know, there's just, like, a weird, could be just, like, a little cat walks by, or, like, a giant fireball smashes into your camp, and now, mm -hmm. like, you're under attack. So it, it's just, it was completely organic storytelling, like, just classic yeah uh D, D role playing experience yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. And that was uh that was Bioware. That was Bioware. Yeah. I didn't play the first Neverwinter Nights. I did play Two. the second one and I did enjoy the Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance games for the PlayStation. Those were more the hack and slashy sort of Diablo style. Yes. They they were, <laughs> but the gameplay was good as opposed to like the Neverwinter Nights and uh dragon age oh you didn't like dragon age i don't Interesting. like the combat system in neverwinter nights as much so you're not a fan of like the crpg sort of pause and plans not 
as much. I'm more of a, if for those, I like it to be free or turn-based. I don't kind of like the strategic pausing because mm-hmm. it kind of breaks the immersion into the story for me. Um, oh, maybe that's why you didn't get into KOTOR like I keep trying to insist. <laughs> it, was, it was like the greatest RPG of all time. <laughs> you say that. I do. No, no, Bioware is great at story. We've been over this a hundred yes, times. Yes. Bioware is fantastic at writing a story. Mm-hmm. They are not the best at making gameplay that is engaging. Uh, I can see where you would come from that. I liked it, but... Now, if we take Bioware and Bethesda and get them to make a game together, I will weep tears of money for them. (laughs) 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 That would be pretty incredible. I will give you that. Won't happen, but it would be a good game. Because Bethesda makes really good gameplay. But their story kind of teeters off. See, this is where you need to get into Obsidian, though. You got Obsidian with KOTOR 2. You got Fallout New Vegas, where they bring, like, they bring their, like, sort of semi-cynical edge to their games. Mm -hmm. Every game they're on, for the most part. Um, And they, you know, they'll retain all the good gameplay. There will be slightly more bugs, unfortunately. But you will have high-quality characters and stories. Like, they built Fallout New Vegas specifically planning... For you to be able to kill anyone in the game, except for children, which, you know, right. that's fine. That's I'll accept that. And the game doesn't break. Like, it still works. It doesn't oh, yeah. rob you of the main experience of the game. And, you know, whether you should or should not, I don't know, build games around that, I don't know. But that is pretty impressive in terms of their, their narrative design. I will, I will give you New Vegas was really good. Yeah, yeah. Vegas I did, I did play New Vegas and complete it before I got Fallout 4. Oh, that's good. How did that make the transition to Fallout 4, though? Uh, not bad. I just, the story, the gameplay in Fallout 4 is great, but again, the open world, that, that Bethesda gets me with our open world RPGs because, mm-hmm. look at this, there's a billion things you can do. We're not going to give you any solid approach of which one you should do aside from here's your main storyline. Mm-hmm. And they go, cool, I'm going to wander off and kill kittens. <laughs> they did make it into an actually good, you know, first uh person shooter basically yeah like, yeah 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 they made the shooting feel good finally spoiler i think the problem i had with the story was that like three out of the four endings you you have to kill your son <laughs> like at the, at the end yeah. i'm kind of like oh that my, i tried to find my son no no i okay you know that that surprises me because you can't kill children in bethesda uh, games but you're killing your son. Because he's an he's adult, an adult. Son. Still your kid. It's a child to you because <laughs> you're an adult. <laughs> now, now, like, the, uh, the, the synthetic that they made out of your son, he's, he can't get killed. That's sad. That's just confusing. It's, yeah, yes, it kind of is. Welcome to Delve. We talk about synths. We talk about synths. Synth. Who's a synth? How to recognize them. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> people don't give uh, Obsidian enough credit, I don't think. Obsidian and Snowblind are both really good studios. I've always, I just like Obsidian has made sequels to some of my favorite games, and I thought that they did a really good job expanding upon the original ones. Kotor 2 was a really good expansion on, on the ideas in Kotor, and New Vegas was a great uh, chapter to follow up three. Stand, standalone yeah, game. Yeah. And Tyranny, which no one played, is amazing. I have not played Uh, Tyranny. What is Tyranny? Yes. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, So Tyranny, uh, you know, in between making Pillars of Eternity, uh, they made Tyranny, which is this uh, CRPG where you play as basically a champion for evil in the world, uh, an arbitrator. Uh, You are definitely the bad guy, and uh, you have to sort of decide what that means and you know it's it's not just like you're hitler it's it's you know <laughs> explores the nuance and complexities of that it came out at a weird time it came out in 2016 so that was strange mm-hmm. bad timing maybe and uh didn't get like a ton of marketing but it's amazing i mean just if you open it up and start it like the the character building experience i think is incredible where you actually talk about how you assisted in the campaign to to conquer the lands um, and that actually affects, you know, not just your character, but the map itself that you're going to be you're going to be playing on. And, and that, to me, is one of the coolest character creation systems I've seen in a in an RPG. Guess I'm going to have to look into Tyranny. Yeah, I get to be evil. You are evil. Well, I mean, even in some of the other games, like even in Baldur's Gate, you could technically play as evil characters. 
you had some yeah options. i mean you are the son of you know the god of of murder <laughs> right yeah yeah and there murder. there were some and there were specifically like evil quests where they're like yeah you do these you're you're going down a bad path <laughs> it's just it's not it's not pleasant you don't have a karma system really but just trust me you're evil now <laughs> <laughs> so neverwinter is really your your introduction to role playing games uh in like a pen and paper uh, capacity yeah that's really where i learned everything i you know i played a character on a server for two years and when they permadeath when they got killed for real no respawning they were they were like leading a a raid into like a drow uh temple uh and they got killed i cried i cried it, it was like real loss after playing a character like for two years this was huge and like this was just like another one of those like mind you know expanding experiences where you're like oh wow a virtual experience can be as you know meaningful as anything else we you know experience in our lives yeah I, i've i've heard about people Man. that had those long campaigns where they just had a character they built them up it, it's they, they played like every week for just years and then their character dies and there's real emotional processing that has to go into that you've you've been on like it might be a game but you did go on that adventure you you were there it was an experience you had and it is now over yeah it was just like you have this i don't know you have this whole alternative universe just kind of opened and then and then when it closes like you can't ever really you, you can never get that one back again. It's like, you know, I'll never really be the same, like, curmudgeon -y old, you know, soldier uh, weapon master that I was playing mm -hmm. uh, before. It's like, even if you remade the same character, they're going to have totally different interactions and stuff. They're going to change how they develop, which is great. But yeah. it's like that. It's, you only get one shot. Unless I come back as a ghost. You come back as your twin brother. Who has the exact same stats. The same, same name. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess it all comes down to your DM. If they'll let you come back as a ghost, gosh darn it, come back as a ghost. Don't don't let me stop you. Man, see that's that is like the tabletop experience. Like it's permadeath unless you get resurrected somehow, and you can't always get resurrected. So I suppose that that depends on your your party and your your GM <laughs> and and your world and, and the world that you're like, in. Yeah, what app? Uh, it's like Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. You get brought back from the dead, but it affects everything now. Yes, it it certainly does. I can't remember what the game was, but there was one. There was one game, and it was an RPG. And uh, so, someone stop me if you know what it is. Uh, but you would be able to play a character and grow and learn, and then if you died, it would be like the next generation. Like it would be your son or or daughter would have all of your traits and would start second generation. And then they, if they died, it would be third generation and fourth generation. It sounds really familiar, but I can't place a name. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was like, well, that's kind of like what Rogue Legacy is like, but that's definitely not the game you're talking about. No, I don't think so. But it, now I'm curious about Rogue Legacy, so maybe I'll have to. It's cool. It's roguelike. You'll die a lot. So your oh, uh, perfect. descendants have to come replace I'm you and stuff. Crazy. Or maybe they're not even your descendants. I might have just made that up. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not it's been sure. It's been a couple years. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. Uh, Someone should make that game if we can't find it, though. Yes. Where you get to play as your offspring every time you die. Yes, make that game. I feel, I feel like there was a, a roguelike that did that, too. Yeah. That was, like, from maybe mobile or, like, a yeah. maybe not mobile, but... I think I, I hope it sounds so. really familiar. Yeah, like that is that is actually a really cool concept because it's like, yeah. oh well, you get your bloodline passed down. Yeah. Please tell me it was not just a fever dream I had. <laughs> that point no, I sw I swear it exists too. Okay. Like the more you talk about, it, the more certain yeah. I am that it exists. Yeah. We're gonna have but to ask no our idea. listeners if anyone knows what game we're, Nathan's describing. Yeah. Let us know because we're not gonna remember it. I'm sure. No. We're and you not. win a new car if you get it right. Yeah. I mean, it might be Ryan's virtual. giving you the new car, <laughs> but with, with all with of all that, that RPG with money, all that RPG yeah, money, it's gonna yeah, make it man. rain all over the dealership for you. <laughs> it's it's great. Um, it might be virtual, and it might just. It might just be a skin for an existing thing in a game. Sorry. Yeah, watch out. I'm I, I'm just gonna give you a an imagined wagon. So that's, that's yeah. The imagine wagon. The imagine wagon. Oh my god, no, that's too. That sounds like too great a gift. You know what? You know what? Heck, I'm giving away the imagine wagon. Perfect. Whoever whoever wants it is gonna get it. It could take you anywhere in the world. That's right. That's right. All you gotta do is guess that game that may or may not exist. Yep.
Exactly. But I guess we mean it, give us like proof that it exists. <laughs> so yeah. that Nathan doesn't think he's correct. just fever dreaming. <laughs> yeah, I don't want yeah. I don't want to be fever. Or make it. If it doesn't exist and you make it, you definitely get an imagine wagon. And then yeah, the imagine wagon is all yours. Hey folks, that's like the best giveaway we've had on this show. <laughs> it's, what, it's like the second giveaway sec- we've had. Second on the show. second best giveaway. Because well, and that makes sense because you know, we work in realms of the imagination. Yeah, it's the best place. It's way better than real life. I mean, that should be obvious, right? <laughs> real life. What's that about? So when you started role-playing, you said 3.5 was really your entry into pen and paper? Yeah, yeah. I played a lot of 3.5. Like, I played sort of sporadically in high school, but actually in college is when I got really into it. Um, I I made a lot of friends who all happened to be they were almost all theater students at DePaul and so they were amazing role players and uh they were super nerdy it was great and uh we played like a lot of long form campaigns that's really when i got into like long form D&D campaigns uh in physical space uh you know playing characters for over a year and stuff and taking them through worlds and then like we did like we we kind of did what you described like we played you know a whole year and a half long campaign in a world and then we got to take new characters into it and like see the way that the world had like reflected you know the deeds of our past heroes all that all that good stuff you expect from a, a D adventure i mean depends on your dm true <laughs> I, I have definitely used past campaigns to, or future campaigns to impact my world I think it's a really great way, you know, to reward, like, what a what a cool way to reward, like, the dedication for people, like, getting people together once a week, every week, for any amount of time is challenging, and it only gets harder. I mean, college was, like, the perfect place for it. Adulting is, adulting just gets in the way of everything. Man, go to college just so you have more time to play role-playing games. Honestly, yeah. that was probably one of the most formative experiences of college more so than getting a you know a degree in creative writing and psychology you know, these things are fine too but i think i honestly learned more from playing D and it didn't cost me tons of money i mean it did because you went to college to do it yeah, yeah true you gotta go to college to find you know to find the right people mm-hmm. though i guess that's that's the trick there's that that brought the group i needed the the hardcore role players i had never known existed right yeah well, you know, there, there's there's our tip for kids uh today if you if you want to get into game design go to college study whatever you want but really just find like a game group while you're there and you, you just learn role playing that yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually true yeah. Yeah, exactly <laughs> that's a hundred percent like my whole my whole career in games and writing basically starts with one of my good friends in college being like, hey, do you want to try writing? He's like, he knew that I I was very focused on my writing. I hated sharing it. I had been writing novels. I was writing a novel a year at that time. Um, And then showing no one and just like essentially leaving them in a file to collect dust. And he was like, hey, do you want to try writing for this game called Golem Arcana that uh, Hairbrain Schemes is working on? And so I end up writing my first piece for them and trying out and they liked it and then i got to work on more stuff and uh i wrote like half the short stories for golem arcana r.i.p golem arcana if you don't know what it is it's a it's a tabletop uh hybrid game that uh sort of strategy turn-based you move around giant golems uh and fight each other uh but it uses this cool little stylus so that you can like interact with the app and the pieces uh in this sort of semi-virtual way that's very cool i don't think i've heard of anything that works quite in that way it was ahead of its time it was ahead of its time Mm -hmm. yeah and now everyone's just got virtual tabletops like actual tables with screens built into them yeah or ar you know that's going to be the next step is ar tabletop games is going to be huge it'll we'll be on the hollow deck we'll be playing that uh chess game han solo plays no sorry no, 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 no. That 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 was C three PO uh, plays a Chewy. Yeah, yeah. We're not. We're really not that far off from that, though. No. Give it like two to three years, and I think we'll start really seeing that happen in earnest. They're making really big strides with like VR, so I mean, they can they can they can slow down. It's fine. <laughs> they can slow down the VR. We've gotten to the point where you're like, uh, could we do less? I just want them to do better. No, yeah, I, I hear you there. No, wait, Ryan. You said a novel. <laughs> you said yeah. you said a novel. Wait a, a year. second. <laughs> uh, th- this is what I'm trying to wrap my head. 
a, a novel a year? Yeah, for five years straight. Now I now not so much, but at the time, yeah, I uh, I was pretty good at doing yeah. that, and I didn't necessarily write like novels that I felt like I was gonna really want to sell, right? Or you know, even want to share. Um, I just thought of it as practice, where I'm like, this is a really good way to learn how to make a cohesive story. I don't know. I was very influenced by like uh, uh, the the uh, book on writing that Stephen King had put out, where he just talked about like the importance of getting uh, a thousand words down a day. And I was mm-hmm. a big believer in that philosophy. Um, and so that's like that was how I trained myself. Okay. Um, granted, now you know, with some hindsight, I don't necessarily think that's the best way to you know sure. become a become a writer but it certainly will it will get you somewhere it is practice it's it's helpful i think now i write a lot slower though because i'm yeah. more focused on writing higher quality yeah stuff the, than I was writing then. the the problem that i always had and it's probably the reason i kept getting writer's block is like i, I say oh this would be a great idea for a for a book and then i start writing it and i start editing myself while i'm writing and it's like oh my god i'm never gonna get past this page <laughs> I'm going to just edit forever on this one thing I'm doing. Yes, that can be so dangerous. That's what I that's what I tried to avoid a lot during that time, where I was like, I'm not going to edit anything till it's all done. Now, you know, that made for a very difficult to uh, revise manuscript. So yeah. now I definitely uh, would say it's it's better for me to do a little more self-editing as I go. But like, you know, when you're just like, I don't know, when you're feeling stuck by your own brain, it's it's yeah. probably best to, to just keep moving forward. Right, yeah. I am always stuck by my own brain. You need an oil can. I need a new brain. I feel you. I would also like a new brain. <laughs> <laughs> we'll trade. We'll see whose is worse. <laughs> my issue with it's writing nice. is that I, I, I have ideas, and then I'm like, these are great ideas. How do I even start writing them down to a place that makes sense the way I want them to? And then I just never do. Because I'm smart like that. There's a thousand different million reasons to not write something. Like, that's, that's the, it's just a battle that I think you have to sort of go through every day. You know, whether you, A, actually have the time to write or not, like, that's going to be probably your first constraint that's going to catch a lot of people. And then B, like your motivation, your focus, um, I don't know. It's not something that's always guaranteed. Like, no matter how much, you know, however far you're, you've gotten in your your sort of your writing path like that i don't think it ever really goes away like that uh, that challenge yeah i keep thinking like when i was like much younger when i was like 10 or 11 i would write all the time Mm -hmm. and and then there's like a point when i was like got in my 20s and it's just like somehow i guess maybe i just became really self-aware but I just like machines. I <laughs> I had to scrutinize. Well, if you're anything like me, you might have anxiety. That might also be true. Like <laughs> like like I don't know. I, it seems common around writers. I would overanalyze. Anxiety, depression, all the same. I have a tendency to overanalyze things where I just go back over things continuously and kind of go, does this sound the way I want it to sound? Ooh, could I read that better? Oh, gee, I don't know. You know what? Scrap the whole thing. I'm going to go and do something else. <laughs> like, I mean, what you were describing was a really good writing process till you, till you said scrap it. Oh, I don't think it's working. Okay, sc- screw it. Just <laughs> move on to something else. And when I was younger, I, I would just kind of go, I want to write a story. Just write the story. Might not have been very good, but it's done. But I did it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah then I did it. Yeah, I mean, finishing a story is huge. And then, like, I don't know, to take it wherever you want, scrap it, re- revise it, rewrite it without, you know, looking at the first manuscript. There's so many different ways you could tackle your next draft. But, yeah, when you when you complete a story, I do think there's, there's a lot you learn from that, for better or worse. Like, most stories that I've completed, yeah. I have chosen not to keep working on. Yeah. <laughs> I was always... Uh, like Stephen King wasn't really my entry point, but uh, Michael Crichton was. And when I would uh, hear what Michael Crichton's process was, it was, you know, do research, do research for like a month or two. And mm-hmm. then uh, you... <laughs> That's basically the opposite of Stephen King from what I can tell. <laughs> yeah, Crichton would just say, like, uh, I'm going to do as much research as I need to do on the book that I want to make. And then when I'm ready to write, I seclude myself in a room. And I start writing. And for like a month, 
that is all I am doing. I eat the same thing. Like, they, they bring me my lunch. It is the same lunch every day, so I do not have to think about it. I am completely focused. And at the end of that month, I have a novel. And that's how I, that's how Jurassic Park happens. Yeah, that will, that will work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, wow, that's discipline. It's really helpful um, to just not have any friends, loved ones, yes. uh, partners, significant partners Helps of any out. sort. No social um, life, no interest yeah. outside of writing, no hobbies. Just have nothing. But truly, truly, I have been most prolific, like, when I moved to Seattle, probably, because I didn't know that many people so just move to a city where you don't know anyone you know you will probably be incredibly depressed and then you'll just be forced to throw yourself into your work that sounds really healthy okay Shit, Man, I I am, to move to a city i'm and... full of bad tips <laughs> when it comes to mental bad health tips with ryan shaples on this episode of Tell how to become a workaholic <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, you know, I feel like uh, there's already like a hundred different suggest podcasts that are about that. We don't have to be another one. It's fine. All right. When you started writing for uh, Golem Arcana, was that, was, the, was that the first time you had worked on like a, a video game? Yeah, yeah, that was the first time. Okay. Um, so that primarily, though, was like a very traditional writing project. I was writing short stories about characters in the world, setting up events. There was a really actually a really cool living lore, this living world where, you know, they would have like, okay, for X amount of weeks there's this special event going on. Go, you know, play, do some tournaments, uh, and then we'll log the results and whatever faction you fought with, uh, and how well they did, that's gonna sort of change things. Um so that was the kind of the cool and tricky part of it is it was sort of a very traditional writing project but then at the end it'd be like oh wait the durani actually won so this ending where they lose obviously is is not going to work anymore it, it's just an interesting uh juxtaposition between like like tabletop gaming and and uh like the digital landscape i always knew you like when i met you originally it was really in the tabletop realm uh during like the the open legends uh period mm -hmm. and so i always kind of associate you with that but, uh, you know, I didn't know that you had, had worked previously in, like, digital uh, before, you, before you had, like, moved on to, like, Hyper and, and those projects. Yeah. Most of the times I thought of it more as a tabletop game than a digital game. Right. And I think it really felt more akin to writing for Open Legend or for Weave versus writing uh, Battletech uh, right. right now. It's, like, it definitely leaned closer to tabletop. Um, and I, I also want to thank you for uh, being part of, of our Christmas special from last year, where you went. Oh, yeah, went, that was super fun. Where we went through the insane candy land I made up for everybody. Uh, yeah, th thank you for, for coming by and playing such a lovely character. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that was uh, that was completely ridiculous. I mean, that's the thing is like. You know, you're talking about like having all these people on and, and, uh, you know, all these, all these different great people. And it's like, yeah, I think like more, more folks should just like invite whoever they want to like their podcasts or to their, their gaming tables or whatever. And you'd be surprised. Like, I feel like most people want to like play games and have a good time. I'm like, oh, yeah. I would, I would sign up for, you know, like, uh, the, the holiday shenanigans like in a heartbeat anytime. Like, that was such yeah. a fun experience to have with you. And I was like, oh man. I've been missing out. I always think about that too. Like, you know, I I was very fresh on being like in tabletop in general, but especially to be a GM. And I I kept thinking like, yeah, this is nice, but I imagine if like you're a celebrity GM, if you're fa if you're on like <clears throat> not saying anyone here has been, but like a GM showdown panel. Um <laughs> that, there were some celebrities on there, there I guess. There were. There were. You you may have been They around. probably wouldn't think of themselves as celebrities either though. Yeah. It's like our tabletop niche is such a small it's much a small part of the gaming world and then yeah. that's like just a chunk of the world as it is. Right. But, you know. Yeah. It's the power of the internet. Right. But I always think like, you know, for people who have kind of gotten put into that that like celebrity gm box man they must have a ball when they actually just get to sit down and play and have somebody else run because i know oh I yeah won. like no pressure <laughs> yeah exactly it's like i finally got a chance to actually play a little bit of D D 5e this year and have other people just run it and i could just be a character 
and I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah, you're like, this is so easy. I love this. I love Why haven't this. I been doing this all along? I I get to be one person. I do not have to be ev- I do not have to be the world. I get to be the one guy. <laughs> Just the one dude. That's it. Yeah, and I think, you know, it is definitely, I don't know, I, every GM has a different philosophy, but I do GM differently when I am GMing for an audience. Like, I do think about that. I don't think that's a bad thing. Some people I don't know. There's a you can get into like, <laughs> there, yeah. There's some real Twitter battles you can you can start uh, when you're if you're not careful about uh, this kind of thing. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I think that's actually not a bad thing to to be focused on what the end experience is like for uh, the audience instead of primarily thinking about your experience for the players. I mean, you're still going to be thinking about that, right. especially if you and the players are all on the same page but like yeah it's a completely different experience than getting to just play privately in your own home oh, yeah. at least for me <laughs> yeah i i guess that was always like a thing i was trying to grapple with like on the one hand since we were doing you know a, a live play and you know I've, I've seen so many streams on the one hand you really want it to be great for the players involved and really have that great synergy like you're playing just just playing a game between people but you also really want it to be something for the audience and so just trying to strike that balance for me was probably the the most challenging thing like is it great to listen to and great for everybody involved yeah, and it's not not an easy balance. Also, like, how do you know what the audience will like or not? That's you know, that's not a uh, an exact science either. <laughs> right. Um. I, I once actually brokered this question to Alex, and and I think I think Alex, your point was if it's not fun for the audience, it's probably not fun for the players. <laughs> yeah. That, that, I would I would agree with that. This amazing thing though is there is a lot of disagreement about how <laughs> how people should like GM performatively or not. You know, you got you got sort of people leaning more indie. You know, Eric Bulgaris. Uh, you got of course people like Adam Koble. You have uh, of course you mentioned Satine, Matt Mercer. Yeah. So many different people, Rudy, um, and so many more who are who are emerging each and every day. And like you know, they're all gonna have a different goal in mind you know everyone is trying to have a great game right for sure and it's like but there's all these sort of other things to to think about it's it's a really uh interesting balance to see but i mean my comment and of course it's just it's just my comment no one has to know how sign off on it is they want to make a great thing that people enjoy and if they're succeeding at that I think it just helps the whole community and really just get tabletop to be way more exposed. And and that can't be a bad thing. Yeah, I think it's been amazing. I think if you are a tabletop RPG creator or otherwise, I don't think this that like we could exist without the boon, the sort of the the sort of huge bubble of of streaming tabletop right now has been amazing yeah. for a industry where, you know, most companies might have like one actual employee uh working on these games might have a bunch of part-time they might have a bunch of freelancers they definitely don't have marketing budgets so people (laughs) marketing budgets are things (laughs) (laughs) i've heard about them i know that they exist but i've never worked on it i don't think i've ever worked on a tabletop rpg where there was an explicit marketing budget necessarily it's more like hey let's try to work with all these cool people and see how to make that happen <laughs> let's just be awesome nathan do we have a marketing budget ten dollars <laughs> ten dollars that's our that's our marketing budget uh, what, a year? i might have i might have spent some of that on discount halloween candy <laughs> Sorry. well you can get at least like two bags three bags maybe you know Depending on your local oh no shop it, of choice, it was it was fifty percent off over here. Whoa! And yeah, nice. candy corn was dirt cheap. It was good. So hey, there's. So that. I'm assuming you're going to be, uh, you know, handing that out and telling people to listen to the podcast. That's that's the marketing portion. Yeah, that's the marketing portion. I shall send you one candy corn by mail. <laughs> Tell no one. You you got to pay shipping, and we're gonna put like a five pound <laughs> rock in it too <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's... great just just because this is viral marketing at its worst <laughs> this is no, no one wants this who wants a single candy corn <laughs> but you know what i would certainly never forget 
you know, about that if you did that. Yeah, so true. Now you you had mentioned Weave, and I guess I'm just not as familiar with it. Uh, but you worked on that for Monocle Society. Yeah, that's right. So Weave is a tabletop role playing game. Uh, that also connects with your phone to sort of just make the entire experience easier. Um, so it works with an app. You scan tarot-style cards to figure out different, you know, traits about your character, backgrounds, etc., items, flaws, uh, all that good stuff. So like you're you're scanning these cards and they're they're giving you different things. Like you like you're a goblin who likes to eat rocks or something, um, and you're just picking from this this sort of pool that you're generating. Uh, on the fly and the same as a uh, storyteller in the game basically you can spring in npcs items enemies bosses uh locations by scanning cards or just you know also you can you can just add whatever you want um so it's a super rules light rpg system i i think it's uh really good if you're trying to get someone who has never played an RPG or maybe thinks that like RPGs aren't for them. It's like it is like the perfect gateway RPG. And th that does feel like it has a little bit of that AR that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, absolutely. There is like this uh connection with the digital uh and the physical there um that I think you're going to probably see more of. Uh um, is uh is weave something that I can get my hands on now or is it uh is it is it in the works? I've been working there for a month and a half now, so my my information is completely unofficial now. Um, so, you know, don't don't believe anything I say. No, uh, the game last I checked was uh, sold out, but I know there will be oh, wow. uh, there might be some. I don't know anything actually, so I'll say there <laughs> probably are copies that are going to be at PAX Unplugged. I know that monocle society will be at pax unplugged and otherwise you can pre-order on the on the website actually the game uh is 30 dollars. look i'm i'm the best ex-employee ever because i will still continue to always we will i will always your thing. shill i will n never keep stop no i think i've just worked on a bunch of awesome games that i'm like yeah people yeah. should still play these people should play open legend people yeah. should keep watching hyper rpg i'm really proud of every project I've worked on, so yeah. it makes it easy. It, that's the best thing is when you can look back and be proud of all of the things that you've you've worked on. Yeah, that is pretty fortunate. Yeah, there maybe like I guess there's like a couple other small contract things that went like nowhere, but you know, those never became public. So it's like yeah. great, don't, don't have to worry about it. <laughs> we're we're all set with that. Since I'm not a, a, a particular industry insider, uh, you you can help me with a couple terms though. Uh, so, sure. so at Hyper RPG, yeah. you were a production manager. What, what does a production manager do? Produces managing. Production manager does <laughs> everything. Um, so what that means is you are creating schedules, developing new shows. Um, so, you know, I would be like adapting game rules to make, you know, new RPG content um, like The Gauntlet. Or I would be making sure that we had guests every day for all the various programming. Uh, you know, I'd be moving furniture from room to room. Uh, sometimes I would just actually uh, be playing games and, and hanging out live as well. Production manager, your job is to facilitate everything, make sure it happens, and make sure it happens as smoothly as possible. So, you know, someone might have some big idea. They're like, let's do a science theme uh all day event how do you do that <laughs> and then you're like well okay and then that was literally my first day my first day at hyper rpg that was the task given to me is plan a 12 hour themed stream and so you're like oh okay we're gonna get like some co2 and do like uh, or not co2 we're gonna get some dry ice and like do some weird dry ice cooking uh we're gonna like have people like put together uh little small paper craft cars and race them uh we're gonna you know do all these weird activities that somehow Ooh. tie in um yeah yeah so that's Man. that's it you just you do it all <laughs> you just do it all so nathan we need a uh, production manager i think that's kind of what i already do <laughs> but on a much but smaller it's, scale it's great though when you when you do your job right it is really like it feels like you just got the most perfect people in the right room to do the right thing at the right time and then you get to like finally you're super stressed and then like when the channel goes live when the show goes live it's just like you can 
sort of relax and enjoy it, but yeah. also not totally relax because you also need to be make, monitoring like audio and video sure. and, and maybe running a camera. Like, so I guess your job never stops. Never mind. Right. <laughs> never. Okay. Okay. I lied. We need a, a marketing and PR person. How about that? Oh, okay. What What are you doing? <laughs> because <laughs> you're he's busy here. i thought we went he, over he is this. busy i'm busy he's, not sleeping he is busy not sleeping yeah, he's got a lot of not sleeping to do uh yeah and uh you know that's fine it's just work it's just it, it's just time that's all time time energy all those things that none of us technically have. so you're the production manager is what i'm hearing nathan i'm essentially the production manager on a much smaller scale than you were but yes on, on the delve cast front yeah it's a, essentially like this and all the other little things that i do on the site we just much. need more uh, content people then there's only so much I can make by myself. <laughs> I can only do so much. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you should just start recording everything you say and just just send that out. Into I'll just the have tw- twenty four hour content all the time. Twenty four hour Nathan. That sounds terrifying. Twenty four hour Nathan sounds like a great name that, for that show. Yeah, that would Nathan, you should do a, a live a twenty four hour live stream. If I had something to do on the twenty four, you know what? I am crazy enough. I would probably do it. I. <laughs> it's horrible. Don't do it. It's horrible. Just as, <laughs> That's right. as the real as the real uh, suggestion here, not the the terrible yeah. one. Uh, you, it's fucking miserable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't do yeah. that. Twenty four hours I... is not you. Sh- you should just have a regular life and sleep and and not no please. Don't do I, that. I thought just, just just once he needs to do the twenty four hours. He needs to be like Nathan's. Time thought-a-thon or something oh, like that where he, he just talks and tells you his thoughts for 24 that's it's, that that feels like a modern art project i don't know if i want to do um it, it'll be a reaction video we'll just give you a playlist 24 hours long and you have to watch oh, it that's just oh my god oh you're gonna make me watch like lasagna cat crap uh but yes <laughs> no that's only four hours oh okay that's fair um but now I'm thinking, right, didn't didn't Hyper do like a twenty four hour? We did a forty eight hour. <laughs> Sorry, you did a forty eight uh, even better. Live stream. <laughs> um, oh that the leading up to that was incredibly stressful. I imagine. Uh, to the point where I was ill by the time it was happening. So like oh. I remember like doing like a we were maybe reading like episode one, Star Wars, and like I had no voice. And I was just like, oh. grab <laughs> like it was horrible. And I'm just like shouting because that's like how I can talk at a normal voice. And, and it was just awful. And then I slept in a tent around like 3 a.m. and felt slightly better the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Did no one don't do don't do 48 yeah. hour streams. I, yeah. Um, or make sure you got a lot of minions for it. Yeah. You know, one or the other. Because I just like I'm always up for a challenge. Like I, when somebody presents a challenge, it like just, it's motivating. But at the same time, I think that that's like a one and done. I could do <laughs> I could do it like the one time and then like I am never doing it ever, ever again. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of amazing. Like when it all comes together and you're like, wow, like this should not be possible. And right. yet we did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. But then also, you know, you could just not do that to yourself. You could also just <laughs> not do that. That's what that's the new the new motto in my life is just because you can do something just because you can write for 24 hours uh to get you know last minute stuff done you shouldn't do that don't put yourself in a position to do that don't let that position be put on you your scientists spent so much time wondering if they could they didn't think if they should (laughs) exactly i feel like that is so common and it's like you know for games and for um streaming uh for i think a lot of different media it's easy to just like put your heart and soul into things which is amazing but also you need to remember to give yourself some breaks who needs breaks just just do because you will burn yourself out <laughs> it, it's no. short time so easy to do yeah so this is actually so you see you think you're uh talking to me but now it's actually just uh future me arguing with past me is is what's happened oh that's fun <laughs> so technically we have two guests on the show at the moment exactly <laughs> we have past, past <laughs> i am a gemini so it's bound to happen me too there you so go. technically there's actually like five of us here yeah so when you were at the uh, seventh sphere your title was a uh, narrative director so what does a narrative yeah. director do so a narrative director is going to be the person sort of leading all the 
concepts for uh, the different you know products you're going to make. So it's like, hey, here is you know here's this world setting. These are sort of the big points about it. Um, and then you might be like, you would be like, hey, you know, can you work on? You might reach out to your other writers and be like, work on this, work on that. Um, and it kind of differs probably. So at Seven Sphere, I still did a, a lot of everything, um, which is, that's, that's a great skill to have. You'll just do a lot of everything. So yeah. I, I learned to do art direction. I coordinated a lot with Brian, who is the founder and sort of creative director of the project. I even did like game design. I developed new mechanics for one of the, uh, Kickstarter backer rewards, Shores of Valhalla, which is of course all about Norse mythology um mm -hmm. so you got to have runes and glyphs and all that good stuff right. so we actually made mechanics for that so ideally what you're doing is you're leading you know a team of writers and uh you know guiding them and shaping them and uh helping them along the way but you know in actuality you know for for a small company it meant that it was a very fancy title but really i was just uh for the most part just writing a lot um yeah i think i wrote like it was about two hundred thousand words worth of worth of content. That's a lot of words. <laughs> That's, a lot of words. <laughs> That's a lot of words. Personally, <laughs> That's... <laughs> and it was great that we had other writers that we were working with. Uh, but yeah. it turned out since I was the one, you know, who was like hired full time to do it, that I had a lot more time to do it than anybody else. Yeah, two hundred thousand words. That's that's like a, well, you know, that whole novel a year thing that you were doing really really geared you up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really it really paid off. We were yeah. trying to write fantasy novels as a, a young adult uh really geared me for for working in tabletop rpgs though i'd say i probably had to sort of unlearn some things working more on on video games but yeah so with some spear though that's uh basically it oh but also you'd be like coordinating with coordinating with like you know the people printing the books and being like where the heck are our books so like I don't know. You're you're always going to do a lot of everything at a small company. You wear many hats, even though you have the, like the one title. Yeah. For a lot of your career, though, you were listed as uh, you've been listed as a writer. Do you like writing as as a capacity when you're when you're working on a project? Yeah, I mean that's that's like the whole reason I am here. The the driving, you know, one of the driving forces, you know, between you know starting at Hyper RPG and stuff was you know getting more connected to to games and to sort of every sort of industry around it and i was always writing you know i was working on seven sphere projects while i was there i was working on personal projects um that never goes away you know regardless of what i've done in my life professionally sure. I'll, I'll always be writing and if i get to write as part of my my day job as part of my professional career i think that's awesome and i want to do that um yeah. but sometimes that hasn't always been available but that's uh that's always been the end goal it's the one thing i know that i'm like really truly great at although maybe a little bit of producing now <laughs> um, right, right i learned to get good at that but uh that's like the one thing that i feel like i'll never get tired of yeah. um it's the, the stuff i do you know on the weekend when i'm like what am i gonna do i'm gonna make no plans with anybody and just keep working on this short story for the whole day whatever it's basically why i'm here why i'm in games like this is a great mm -hmm. place to be a writer potentially it's also a hard place to be a writer but do you have a, a specific thing that you like to to do when it comes to writing do you like the the world building aspect the character design mm. the favorite methodology like i love i definitely love world building going back to like those tabletop rpg roots but what i what i really love is like trying to like uh you know be like maybe like slightly pretentious like i get really excited <laughs> about trying to like slip like you know a little bit of uh sort of like maybe slightly like heightened prose into what i'm working on like just like mm -hmm. trying to remind people that like i mean for me it's like why i love writing is like i love reading something that is beautifully constructed not just like interesting in terms of plot and character and theme but like truly someone has thought about the words um, that they put down and picked very specifically. And um, I love the technical sides of writing, actually, is what I'm saying. Like, I, if anything, I've struggled with the non-technical sides. Like, it's so focused on, like, the yeah. the individual word choice and grammar and syntax. Sometimes they uh, forget about the rest of the story. You you were talking about how, like, Stephen King inspired you. Are there other writers that you kind of look toward for inspiration now? Mm, well, it's interesting because I would say Stephen King 
as a writer doesn't inspire me at all hmm. i don't really care for his works like i tried to read dark tower didn't like it i, I got like somewhere i think i got through the second book and just couldn't keep going um you know the the people who really inspire me are people like uh samuel delaney margaret atwood sort of people who are looking to sort of cross the bridge between uh literary and non-literary genres that's always who i've who i've been attracted okay. to but i appreciated that book by stephen king on writing was still a great read um and i have respect for oh, anyone yeah. who's as prolific as him even if i don't necessarily enjoy his work and sometimes it's helpful reading stuff that you know is outside of your wheelhouse yeah i mean part of right part of being a writer or any creative is like developing your own sense of like taste you know your style so like knowing what you don't like and why you don't like it that's as important and often more important than knowing what you like or what you think you're good at like often i feel like writing is like you're just you're creating all these little rules to follow <laughs> all the little rules <laughs> <laughs> we're self-imposed but we, we've come up with a whole bunch of rules. Yeah, well, you got to, right? Otherwise, yeah. it's like there'd be too many choices. Well, it's <laughs> like when it comes to writing, sometimes people will be giving you structure, but sometimes you just have to impose structure upon yourself. Yeah, well, you got to you gotta find what, like, excites you, right? Like, if you're not, if you haven't found, like, I don't know, this is, this is something that I, I feel like I've been really good at. Like, regardless of the project I'm working on, like, I, I feel like I always try to find the things about it I really like and gravitate towards that and, like, really emphasize them like that's that's so key when you're writing two hundred thousand words um you gotta you gotta make sure that you're having fun doing it or else you're gonna write a horrible book, <laughs> book it's gonna suck yeah that's the little voice in the back of your head i mean that is basically that voice is like the probably the driving voice in my head or more so it's like there's like the voice that just says you're just you're done you'll never be able to write and like yeah. that's like every day what I feel is like I am just fighting against that belief. I'm trying to prove to myself that I can still write every day. It's imposter syndrome. Yeah, you never quite get past if, it. If anyone knows how to how to, how to do it, <laughs> Send, tell us. Tell us all. <laughs> There's got to be someone who has so much confidence. They're like, nope, I've always been awesome. I <laughs> just have. Yeah, what does that feel like? That must be amazing. Like, wow. I can't imagine. You probably like stand a little straighter, breathe <laughs> deeper. Oh, yeah, you got proper posture. You you feel good about yourself every day. You wake up, sun shining. The birds are chirping just for you. It's great. They are. <laughs> Is that what they're doing? They're chirping for me. Honestly, we should all think that way. We'd probably be a lot better off. Yes. Just assume the world is here for you. You'll probably feel better. <laughs> are you trying, <laughs> to, are you trying to tell it. me it's not? <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys getting at? Alex, it's it's okay. We're just saying that we are now validating the fact that it's okay that it is. Oh, good. Okay. Good, good, good. Be, so you feel better about it? Um, okay. Maybe. I mean, as long as Alex feels good about it, that's all I can ask for. Oh, also, the game I was thinking about, where you go from one generation to another and pass down your collected knowledge, was Rogue Legacy. Uh, Ryan was correct. Although, I will say there is another game that I was just looking at today called Sunless Skies, which is implementing something similar to that. So maybe we'll see more of it in the future. I kind of like it as a, a mechanic. It, it seems like something worth exploring further. On the next episode, we're going to be talking to Ryan about what he is currently doing, and it's the reason I really wanted to have him on the show, because they just released Battletech Flashpoint. He's been writing that. I really wanted to explore a lot of the correlation between his time in tabletop gaming and his time in a digital landscape, and uh, sort of the correlation between those two, or the contrast. He was very gracious in talking about Battletech and about Hairbrain Schemes and what he has learned from both of those realms. And we're going to get into a really neat conversation with him about all of that on the next episode. Also, if you are paying attention to numbers and such, you probably noticed that we are now at our 200th episode. And uh, we kept wondering what we were going to do for our 200th episode. And we kept thinking maybe, maybe, maybe we would actually just have Alex and me talk about our plans for the show in the future. And we're still probably going to be doing that episode. But um, we had recorded this episode with Ryan uh, a month or so ago. 
and I had not been able to release it. We had other things that were coming up that that had some urgency behind it, and I kind of feel like it was perfect that it it worked out that way because uh, he has been in so many different areas of the industry. It, it feels very pertinent to uh, our journey through tabletop media at the same time. But we do still have to do uh, an episode where Alex and I talk about the future of the show because we, we are going to try some new things. And there are some other projects that are kind of delve related, but they're they're kind of separate things all to themselves that we have been talking about and have gotten kind of excited for. But we'll do that on another episode. This episode is already really, really long. So we'll get to that at another time. In the meantime, though, 200 episodes. Yay, right? That doesn't even include the live plays and the and, and the live shows that we did on Twitch. So technically, it's probably like 204 or 5. But you know what? It, 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 numbers. What does that mean, really? Think about it. It's like your age. Does it really matter? How old does the podcast feel? Does it feel like it's 200? I don't know. You'd have to ask it. It doesn't want to go for any checkups. If you want to find Ryan on Twitter, just go to at Ryan Shapples, and that is R-Y-A-N-S-C-H-A-P-A-L-S. You can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. You can also find us at DelveCast.com. It's where the entire hub of information from videos that I put together to uh, the podcasts that we release to articles that we write. It is all available there. When you go check out our Patreon and become a patron, we have a lot of uh, unedited episodes and first drafts of different content that we've put together over there. Uh, and we would also like to extend a hearty thank you again to our shiny level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. And of course, if you would like to get the show as soon as it releases, check us out on iTunes, Google Play, and all the other places where quality, handcrafted podcasts are sold and distributed. And finally, as we hit our numbered 200th episode, I also just wanted to say thank you to all the people who have listened to us these many years. Thank you for sticking with us through the, the best episodes that we had, and the worst. Like picking up the pieces where we talked about the design of game pieces. Yeah, not our best work. There's probably others. Uh, hey, you know what? If you happen to know the worst episode that we did on the show, feel free to comment below in the post. Oh, actually, that's a fun idea. If you have, uh, if you have your uh, favorite episode or your least favorite episode or something like that, contact us on uh, DelveCast.com or over on Twitter at Delve Podcast, or uh, on our Facebook group, which is DelveCast. And uh, we can actually talk a little bit about that uh, on a future episode. Maybe that episode where Alex and I are discussing future plans for the show. That would be kind of cool. And it would be interactive, like people could be involved. Yay, you're part of the show too. There's a thought. Go do that. We'd love to hear from you. On the next episode, we're going to be talking to Ryan about a video game. That seems almost blasphemous, but we're going to do it. Until then, thank you for joining us. Good gaming. But I, I have this whole thing, Ryan, where like I've decided that my new goal is to collect the entire uh, GM showdown panel. And so, like, oh, sure. So yeah. like now I'm about halfway through. So I just I just have to get the other half and I will have officially completed the collection. So, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, and I assume you're trying to get the full two panels worth. I, I got it. Yeah. Oh, that's true. There were two panels, that's and there were, right. a few, there were there 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 were some change outs in the other pan. Oh man. Okay. No, I'm not halfway through. Had we done this appropriately and thought this out ahead of time, and you're like, oh, I want to get the entire GM showdown yeah. panel or multiple panels on, we should have like figured out a question or a couple questions to ask them each. Oh. And then we that could have paired the episode like it was actually a panel. Oh, that would have been something. That would have been really cool. Yeah. Uh, you guys got to go back in time now and make this right. I got to go back. We and just got to gotta do it in the future. Yeah. <laughs>